um, Jason McClure, the chief scientist at Princeton Instruments. And uh, I have a very interesting talk uh, to give to you guys today. It is about a new spectrograph that we've developed uh, called the schmidt zerny turner So we're <clears throat> gonna change gears a little bit. We're going, think back to Julio's talk uh, yesterday, we're going back to spectroscopy now. But we're not switching gears completely because I saw a little bit about aberration theory talked about in the previous, uh, in the previous talk, and we're actually going to see a little bit of that again in this talk. And before I talk about what this schmidt zerny turner spectrograph is, I'd like to mention a little bit about its predecessor, the zerny turner Imaging Spectrograph. I'll mention some of the applications uh, in which this instrument is used, um, limitations uh, in the design of this instrument, and as I was alluding to, they have to do with image aberrations. And then I'll introduce the schmidt zerny turner uh, I'll talk about two application highlights that exemplify the instrument and a few concluding remarks. But, so now, where, where do you see the Cerny Turner spectrograph? Well, what is this? Well, it's a, it's a dispersive optical spectrograph. So if you go down to Julio's lab, any dispersive uh, optical instrument in there probably a 90% chance it's going to be of the traditional Cerny Turner type design. And these instruments find their use in so many fields of research, uh, Raman spectroscopy, photoluminescence spectroscopy, photolu photoluminescence emission excitation spectroscopy, transmittance, reflectance measurements, some that we've not, uh, uh, we've not heard here yet uh, in the last two days, and those are, uh, for instance, spectral domain optical coherence tomography. The back end instrument for that is the Cerny Turner spectrograph. Um, also, up and coming techniques Fourier domain dispersive spectroscopy. This is where instead of projecting the image of your sample onto the entrance slits, you actually uh, locate the Fourier plane at the entrance slits of the spectroscopy. So you get a momentum space information along the vertical axis of the instrument and then wavelength space information along a different axis. And one thing that is really interesting that I've, I've noticed over the last you know, several years is that there is a, a, a definite movement towards multimodality techniques that generate more information rich data. And what I mean by that is the hybridization of many different types of techniques into, into, into one technique that can deliver to you um, more information rich data and give you more uh, 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 specific you know, results. So we've seen this already in, in, in the form of hyperspectral micro-Raman imaging. This is the hybridization of the Raman spectroscopy technique and microscopy. Also, we heard a talk yesterday about tip-enhanced Raman spectroscopy. Of course, this is the hybridization of the atomic force microscope with Raman, Raman spectroscopy. A few others, optical coherence tomography and micro-Raman imaging or mapping. This is actually used for cancer detection and a few others, you know, MRI with uh, X-ray CT and photoluminescence, or a few others to mention. But one thing that a lot of the techniques that uh, deal with um, uh, Raman imaging and spectroscopy and things like that all have a, a microscope at the heart of their um, uh, at the heart of their setup. And one thing that I was pondering was, well, where are all the innovations occurring? And you're seeing a lot of these multimodality instruments um, being developed. And if we look at the sample stage area, you see, well, okay, TERS is a great example, near field scanning optical techniques. There has been a lot of innovation in this part of the optical uh, setup. And okay, if, if we're talking about uh, a Raman mapping or Raman imaging system, there's going to be some interface that's going to introduce the laser excitation into the microscope and allow us to deliver the scattered light back to the spectrograph. And we've seen over the years plenty of uh, developments in terms of the incarnations of these Raman interfaces that allow the, the delivery of the light back to the spectrograph. Um, this is just a, an image of some more sophisticated techniques that employ spinning disk confocal microscopy or scanning um, basically sl uh, pattern scanning of the laser excitation across the sample. Um, so all of these are uh, at the, uh, at sort of this light interface part in the experiment, but 
where are the innovations at the very back of all of this? I mean, at the back of all these experiments is a Cerny-Turner spectrograph. And that is going to be the, the basis of this talk, is where are, how, how come we have not seen any innovations in the, uh, in the back end of this? And as I mentioned, uh, it is a Cerny-Turner spectrograph that is going to be uh, the last optic in all of these setups. And this instrument actually has not seen any innovation in about 30 years. I mean, that, you know, I'm only 33. I mean, you know, so for about as long as I've been alive, this instrument hasn't changed. And to me, that was really interesting. And again, I like to stress that there is a strong movement towards multimodality techniques that require spatially resolved spectral data. And that is, you want to be able to acquire uh, data in a two-dimensional array at the focal plane of this device. And as I've hinted, the major problem with this image, or this instrument, are image aberrations. As we saw in the previous talk, uh, the three first sidel aberrations that destroy an image are spherical aberration, chromatic aberration, and astigmatism. And those are listed here in the order of their severity. And these are the three main players in the Cerny-Turner spectrograph. So to quickly go through these spherical aberration, shown here through a ray trace, what it, it's caused by the use of a spherical mirror or a lens to form an image. And it appears as this radial blur about an object that you've imaged. In this, in this case, 150 micron core fiber gets blurred out to a 180 to 200 micron image. Um, its effects on spectroscopy, it will limit both spatial and spectral resolution in the instrument. It also goes as one over the F number cubed. So the shorter the focal length of the instrument, uh, this effect uh, increases rapidly. Uh, chromatic aberration. If you've collected a spectrum of an atomic emission lamp through a spectrograph, a dispersive spectrograph, it was through a traditional Cerny-Turner spectrograph, and at some wavelength, you probably saw the peak looking asymmetric. That's caused by coma. Coma comes from the use of any lens or mirror at an off-axis angle. And because we don't punch holes in the mirrors in a spectrograph, we have to use them off-axis. Ergo, there's going to be coma. Now, the most uh, heinous aberration in a Cerny-Turner spectrograph is astigmatism. And if you've ever wanted a good um, example of, a, of astigmatism, just look at the two-dimensional image in a traditional Cerny-Turner spectrograph and you will see a great example of astigmatism. So I have to explain how this image was generated because it's a little, it's a little complicated. We take a linear array of uh, 100 micron fibers. You see these are alternating in color. Well, the green ones in this image are actually illuminated and they're illuminated with an atomic emission lamp. And the red ones I actually have off in this, in this particular image. And so what you're going to see are discrete images of that fiber at where my discrete emission lines are. And in a perfect world, this should just be essentially a two-dimensional matrix you know, of the images of this fiber at the locations of where the emission lines should be. Now, what does astigmatism do? Well. It's a separation of the tangential and sagittal focal planes. And what happens is in, in the uh, sagittal plane, you have a horizontal broadening of a point. And in the tangential plane, you have a vertical broadening of the, of the image. Now, anyone that designs a spectrograph is going to do the following. They're going to go, hey, well, the, the wavelength resolution direction is this direction. So I'm going to make it so that the, the spots get elongated vertically so I don't kill the resolution in the instrument. But OK. Um, well, wh what does this do when we start to look at how our spectrum is going to be affected by this? Well, OK, like I was saying, in, the wave, in this direction of uh, the dispersion, this is where I get my wavelength resolution. OK, things don't look too bad. I still get a relatively sharp peak. OK, fine, spectroscopists have apparently been happy for three decades with this. <laughs> um, you see this fall off in intensity. Well, th what's happening is the fluence is going down. Why is it going down? Well, because here you have a very high fluence because the spot's not aberrated. And then as you move out to the edge of the focal plane, it becomes aberrated. Hence, the fluence goes down. You don't get great signal to noise at the edge of the detector. If we look along a vertical direction, OK, 
we all know what we probably should see. We should probably see individually resolved images. Instead, I, I don't know what this is, but it, it does go to show you that you, you're getting a lot of light where you shouldn't be getting light. So if you try to do quantitative measurements and you think you know how much light you should be seeing that's getting contributed to a particular peak at a particular wavelength, that might not be the case, especially when you look up at the corners here. I mean, these, these peak profiles are actually rotated and stretched, and they're stretched also in the horizontal plane, which is the direction of the wavelength dispersion. So, all right, this is the, the best picture of all. So, the same fiber assembly, this is a, a linear fiber array, but instead of illuminating it with a discrete uh, atomic emission lamp, I've put a, a, a continuous source, a quartz tungsten halogen lamp, on uh, uh, through the fiber. So what you would see is if this camera could discern color, is you would see a progression from blue to red, left to right across the focal plane, and this is just the row number on my CCD. Now, it, it, you would be pretty upset if you woke up in the morning and you had a clear image at the center of your field of view and was blurred everywhere else. I mean, this is what it probably looks like when you get hit in the face by Mike Tyson. But for some reason, again, for 30 years, this, is, this has been fine. Well, this is, this is what it should look like. And this is what we've done. We've completely eliminated the image aberrations in the instrument. This is how this should look. In between every other channel, I've actually, uh, uh, I have atomic emission lines separated between all of them, showing that there is no longer any crosstalk between them. And if I were to add back the uh, continuous source on all of those, you see this is what the image on the previous slide should have looked like. This is the, uh, the instrument that's actually doing this. So it, if you remember back to what the uh, original, I had a little graphic that showed how the layout of the traditional Cerny Turner looked. This is quite a bit different. White light hits a collimating mirror, a grating. I'll call this a magical mirror. <laughs> then onto a camera mirror, and then back to a CCD detector. Now, I'll get to an application highlight um, to exemplify the instrument's performance. And uh, what I've done here is I've taken uh, one micron monodispersed polystyrene spheres in a colloidal solution. And these materials are really fun to play around with because you can get them to self-assemble into monolayers and multilayers uh, really easily. You really don't have to know what you're doing to do this. Um, and you can grow these on a, uh, on a substrate pretty easily. And if you illuminate them with a dark field illumination, you get um, diffraction and you can, uh, it, what'll happen is the grains that will form typically will have different uh, tilts, they'll have different domains, they'll be oriented differently. And if we zoom out, what you end up seeing is this nice mosaic pattern with different uh, grain boundaries and domains. And illuminating this in a dioscopic illumination with a dark field illuminator, you can actually see that uh, some of these different grains are uh, diffracting uh, significantly different wavelengths. And uh, you can perform uh, hyperspectral imaging on this sample and then uh, basically tag some of the different uh, wavelengths you're seeing transmitted through here with different markers and produce a hyperspectral image. But before all that, you have to first couple your microscope to a spectrograph, and in the case of this, it's the SCT. And if you take the grading in this instrument and you move it to zero <laughs> order and you open up the entrance slits, what you end up with is a is a monochrome image of the sample. And you can see this is the image that you get through the instrument, and this is the uh, dark field image that I was getting through the microscope. They're actually, they actually look identical to one another. So what you can do then is close the entrance slits down and define a very narrow strip in one direction along the sample, and then scan the sample in one direction, collecting a, an image uh, a two-dimensional spectrum at every point along the way. And you can build up a spectrum for every pixel in your final image and select several wavelength bands of interest 
and form a uh, composite hyperspectral image from that material. And the take home point from this is if you use an instrument that doesn't have significant image aberrations in it, the hyperspectral images or composite Raman, or not Raman, transmission images that you get from this um, look incredibly clear in comparison to what the uh, actual uh, optical image looked like. Um, a, uh, a second application highlight that I'd like to mention is we were fortunate enough to uh, be able to send this instrument to uh, Osaka University where the uh, uh, research headquarters is for nanophoton. And at a, I, I will mispronounce the, the director's name of the lab, Katsuwasa, I think. Um, uh, we were fortunate enough that he uh, w uh, allowed one of our uh, application scientists to bring the instrument in and collect some data uh, with the instrument coupled to the nanophoton uh, scanning confocal Raman microscope. And shown here, uh, three Raman images coming from uh, different spectral, uh, diff different uh, wave number uh, peaks uh, from HeLa cells. And from this, we formed the composite Raman image showing clearly the differentiation between the cytoplasm of the cell, the mitochondrial locations, and the, the nucleic acids. Um, and this pane down here is just yet a different ensemble of the images, but it goes to show the performance one can achieve with an instrument that is free from aberrations. Um, and with that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, all the engineers that actually helped make this possible and the uh, Katsumasa Lab at Osaka University for uh, performing some of the uh, uh, testing of this, of this instrument. I thank you for your attention, and I will take any questions you might have. I can't say. <laughs> but it, it does help the instrument achieve the imaging performance that, that, that it does have. Um, surprised no one's asking why we called it the Schmidt Zerny Turner. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll bite. <laughs> okay. Well, so uh, the theory uh, that was used to derive all the aberration um, functions came from both the work of Seidel and the work of Schmidt. And so a lot of it was uh, in the work of Schmidt. And if you read the uh, the historical papers on the Cerny Turner and sort of marry these two together, then that is what you get. Well, All right. Thanks, Jason. Thank you.